I've used the stereo strings myself for at least 30 years, if not more. Everybody who comes in here, with very, very few exceptions, plays the stereo strings. And they didn't get there because of any reason except dependability and tone. I'm Ted Drozdowski, Editorial Director of Premier Guitar. We're here at the uh, Third Man Records Blue Room in Nashville, Tennessee, and tonight Buffalo Nichols is playing, and he is right here with us. It's good to see you again. It's been a couple of years since I last heard you play live. Yeah. Uh, and uh, just that little bit of your playing in the introduction sounded great. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I think of you as a living link between the past and present of great American music. Oh, thank you. You know, what yeah. you do is so deeply rooted, and yet you are looking at the stars, and I think that's really awesome. Yeah, that's what I'm so, trying to do, thank you. Uh, well, and you've got a new record on Fat Possum, it's your second one. That's right. And it is called The, the Fatalist. Fatalist. Yeah. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> yes, and it's really cool. Uh, it, it just embodies what we talked about a second ago. Yeah. So if anybody out there has not heard it yet, tune into this album and check it out. But right now, Man, let's tell us about your guitars. You've got uh, four guitars and a banjo here. Yeah. And I know you're going to use the hell out of all of them. That's so right. So let's start with this recording, Kay. Yeah, I use this one a lot. This is the uh, RO328. Um, I keep this one tuned to uh, like an open C sharp minor. And sometimes the, the Skip James tuning, what we call it. Yep. But uh, sometimes the major as well. And. Uh, I got the uh, Seymour Duncan mag mic in it. So I do like, kind of, depending on the room or the situation, I'll do like straight up microphone and do the acoustic kind of stuff. And sometimes I'll run it through the amp. And, cool, yeah. and we're gonna get to that too because you're splitting your signal in a bunch of interesting ways. Yeah. And there's lots of cool sounds coming up. So mm -hmm. we're gonna do that. So we, uh, shall we look at another guitar? Yeah, sure. As far as the acoustic goes, I also played this uh, Recording King parlor guitar. Not sure of the model number, but they hooked me up with the fancy inlays on it. Oh yeah, on it look everything. at that. That's nice. This one I use for a standard tuning in the real, you know, country blue stuff. Um, yeah, this one has got the internal microphone, so just the real, the real stuff. You know? Excellent. Yeah, parlor guitars are great, man. I mean, I love the way that they uh, cut through a mix in the studio. Yeah. You know, most of the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's just something about them that's magical. Rob hey, if it, Parlor guitar is good enough for Robert Johnson, right? Yeah. Right. I mean, I don't, know. I don't know what he was playing. I never asked him. But. He was, <laughs> well, he was playing one of those Gibson Double O's, you know, the little uh -huh, guys. Yeah. And uh, he was you know, obviously pretty darn good at that thing. Yeah, and it's great on stage. You know, I used to play the uh, Dreadnoughts a lot, but, you know, different rooms can give you some issues. But this one's pretty, pretty consistent. Well, what string gauges do you use on your acoustics? Um, this is the only one where I'm using just, like, mediums, mm -hmm. 13 to something. But on all of my other guitars, I'm using... What is it? Uh, 16 to 56. Okay, that's so a hearty. Like, uh, it's a hearty gauge. Yeah, it's kind of dangerous, but. <laughs> <laughs> now you came up playing uh, punk rock. I know you were in the culture. Were you also playing punk rock and metal too? In yeah, I was, which is kind of how I ended up playing with the really low um, tunings and the heavy strings because I was switching over to slide and just never felt quite right. So I looked over to my, you know, beefy strings from my, you know, drop C days. <laughs> and I put them on and it just, it just worked, felt a lot better. Cool. Yeah. But yeah, I definitely was doing that in my high school years mostly. And uh, yeah, a lot of punk and metal stuff so, like that. So what made you sort of go down the blues path from punk and metal? Uh, there's a lot of reasons, but uh, I just, you know, once I got older into my 20s, I started just uh, wanting to try different things. And uh, I wanted to be a little more independent. So just singing songs and playing acoustic guitar just gave me that freedom to just to move around and I didn't have to worry about having a band and those pesky drummers and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, well as an improviser it gives you so much freedom too. I yeah. Think. You to uh, just kind of play. Yeah. Uh, and this is a, is this a beard? What kind of guitar is this? What this is, at? yeah, the Paul Beard Gold Tone. Uh, okay. Um, this is probably the newest one for me. Uh, I just like the 
aesthetic of having the metal body resonator. And other people like it too. It makes me seem more authentic, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I fly a lot, so I wanted something that I could fit in like a guitar boat kind of thing and just have it be easier to, to travel with. So I got the, I wanted a thin body one. Yep. So I got this and I ended up using this actually more um, like an electric with the lipstick pickup in there. And I play it through the amp and had and is, that a, is that a beard pickup in there as well? Um, I don't know. It's the one that came stock with it. Okay. So possibly. Cool. And that's a that's a single cone, isn't it? Or is it a tricone? Yeah, but it looks like it's a single cone in there. And this one the same thing. I kinda have like a customized set, but it's the same as the the uh, the ones I keep on my my acoustics. I just got the individual gauges, like sort of sixteen, eighteen, or fifteen. You know how it works. Very yeah. heavy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're very heavy. That's <laughs> yeah. cool. And um, what was the first resonator guitar you played? What did you start playing resonator on? Um, Cause they can be unruly beasts sometimes. Yeah, I got the first one I ever had was uh, I ordered it from like a, a Shanghai or something. I don't even remember what the <laughs> brand was. <laughs> like I had to yeah, get it shipped off the boat and everything. Uh, and I played that for a while and it was uh, just kind of unreliable, although it did sound great. And then I started getting the uh, Recording King um, and that was kind of what I started using. Uh, my first album has a lot of that on it too. So tricones mainly. I was really into the tricones. Yeah. But I think they're a little bit heavier. I feel like they're heavier. So I kind of, you know, trying to save my back, thinking about the future. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. For those like, well, yeah, it could be rough. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I used to tour with Les Pauls, and there was a place we played in uh, St. Louis where we played from nine to six. Oh yeah. And now when you put that Les Paul on for the last set, that hurt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It'll catch it just up hurt. With you. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, great. So, and can we take a look at the other resonator yeah, as well? Yeah, I got one more over here. We're going to talk about this guitar in a second, but yeah. what, what tunings are you using all together? Uh, so, this guitar stays in the open C sharp and C sharp minor. Uh, the gold tone is a, uh, it's like open F, but all of my stuff is kind of tuned down a half step. So. Whatever that is. Yeah, yeah. I play blues, I don't know these letters and stuff. <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, uh, that one also. And then that one is uh, open C-ish and then standard on, on the parlor guitar. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And these tunings, as you mentioned earlier, you alluded to Skip James. Yeah. And uh, there's a guy named Henry Stuckey who sort of brought these tunings back from uh, playing uh, with, uh, with uh, soldiers from other countries in World War II, mm -hmm. from guys from the islands and stuff. Yeah. So you're part of this big tradition but you're expanding it and taking it to a bunch of cool places. And this is a cool guitar anyway. So before we get into that too much more, why don't you talk about this Hiplican Mule? Yeah, this is my mule. It's the Mavis. Uh, it's really like taking on a life of its own. People will sometimes show up to my gigs just to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the guy Matt from Mule, he reached out to me one day and I think it was before I had a record deal or anything. He was just you know, he keeps an eye on guitar players on the internet and he just, you know, he wanted me to play one and, and now I am very grateful for that. Um, it's got this kind of P90 style looking thing. Yep. I don't know really what's going on in there, but um, I think this one actually is a tricone. I think a lot of the mules are, are have three cones in there, but they look like a single cone. I could be making that up, but I think <laughs> it, feels, it feels right. <laughs> well, I like the pit guard too, and I like that single old school uh, Control on top, the volume control on top. Yeah, the it has the vibe of like those old harmonies and K's and stuff. Yeah, definitely. You know, but in a resonator, so that's pretty it. Yeah. How is the neck on this thing? Is it a, a thick profile neck? Or it's skinny? kind of in the middle. I, I guess it's hard to say because I've been playing a lot of really beefy necks, so I have a different kind of standard. But it's not it's not super thin, but it's not like overly baseball batty either. And, and the detail is great too. I love the way that they've aged. Uh, yeah. You know, they've aged the pickup cover. They've aged the. Uh, uh, cover on top of the uh, uh, resonator chamber, the, even the hardware on the tuning pegs looks like it's uh, been sitting around for 30 years. Yeah, but, uh, people think it's a lot older than it is, and uh, you know I beat it up with myself a little bit, but it all just really goes well together. It's great. Well, it's a hip guitar. Can we hear a little bit of it? Yeah. And I'm going to just pull back a little bit, so I'm out of the way. <laughs> yeah, I do. Uh, you know, I play it clean a lot, which is really pleasant. of the effects like I was doing earlier. And uh, 
And uh, yeah, sometimes I'll just run it through the uh, my acoustic uh, signal chain and you know, give it a kind of. I think that's playing in there, but yeah, it it, it kind of sounds pretty cool with the uh, my acoustic chain and just give it a more natural sound too. Yeah, it's just a really good sounding guitar. Period. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, we were talking earlier about the sort of idea of bridging the past and the present. Not only are you doing it with effects here, but on the album, you're also uh, using interesting sampling stuff, and yeah. uh, you make great use of the spectrum in mixing. You yeah. know, I thought that was great. Uh, whether I was listening to it on my stereo, because uh, I still have one of those big ass stereos, the big speakers at home, yeah. or whether I was listening to it on my laptop, you just really have this great sense of dimensionality and separation. Oh. And that's something you don't really hear in a lot of blues records, period, yeah. let alone blues records that are so deeply rooted in country blues. Uh -huh. So, awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah, and that's something I try to bring to the live set as well, because acoustic instruments and like heavy low end don't typically go together. Um, so you have to kind of come up with creative ways to get it to, to fit. And a lot of that is just like how I play the instrument too, which like give space to the low end and there's a lot of different, different ways to approach it. Yep, you're doing a lot of the stuff with the thumb on the low strings to kind of keep that drone going yeah. and the rhythm in there. Mm -hmm. yep. um, that's a very hip mule, as I said earlier. Uh, yeah. But let's uh, move to the banjo now. All right, you yeah. only got one of those. That's right. <laughs> and I've gotten to the point in this tour where my gear starts to fall apart, but this banjo's hanging on for dear life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how long have you been out so far with this record? Um, it's, let's see, it's December now. I've been out since uh, August. Ah, huh? that's a haul. Yeah, I'll get home for like a week or two at a time, but it's been, yeah, pretty much since August. Um, but yeah, I got this, another Recording King instrument um, that I, I do a lot of like claw hammer primarily. Um, so it's got the kind of scoop fretboard there and got the K. Actually, this has two pickups that I sometimes will split to do weird stuff too, but usually I'm using the K and K underneath here for the natural banjo sound. And what's the other pickup in there? It's the uh, Fishman like bridge kind of thing. I'm not sure exactly what it's called. Okay. And sometimes I'll run more of the effects through that. You know, it's a little bit less uh, finicky with the uh, effects and distortion and stuff. Cool. And what made you uh, select this particular banjo? I noticed it's got a, a ring on it, so it's got a little extra weight and density. And um, Yeah, this one is kind of caters to the old time kind of music. You know, it's got the sound because it doesn't have the, you know, the resonating back. And uh, yeah, this kind of scooped out area. Stuff like that. That's what I wanted. Cool. Yeah, the scooped out area is cool. It yeah. gives you a little bit more room for your hands and mm -hmm. comfortable picking spot. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, thank you. Yeah. So, with so many instruments, uh, and so many different tunings, uh, and you know, just this one amplifier, yeah. a new super reverb. How do you make that all work? Uh, well, really, I use so many pedals that every amp that I use sounds the same anyway. <laughs> 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 but I, I was, I've been trying a lot of different amps and even the amp sim pedals and everything. Um, but because I tune so low, I found that the 410s really works out. Mm -hmm. So I wanted something like that. But I travel with way too much stuff as it is, so I went actually for the uh, the Tone Master Super Reverb, which is the very light, solid state one. Yes. And it's very, very versatile, so I can get you know a pretty good range of, of tones out of it. Yeah, the Tone Master stuff is really nice, mm -hmm, yeah. and uh, about a quarter of the weight. Yeah. <laughs> which is that. also really nice when you're hauling around a Super Reverb. Yeah, definitely. Um, and do you have a? I, you know, I don't see a volume pedal offhand here, but how do you compensate for different volumes on the instruments? Uh, I don't. I just confuse the sound engineer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, well, why don't we take a look at the pedal board then? Yeah, let's do it. The coding durability test puts excess through a cycle of 10,000 strums. Through the lens of a microscope, it is clear that excess retains its composition better than other coded strings. Testing complete. Why don't you take us through your signal chain? Yeah, it's very confusing. <laughs> Sometimes I'll be up here like pushing buttons and hoping that the right sound comes out. Um, but the main thing um, is I go into the polytune, yep. of course, and then underneath is a compressor, which is the origin effects, the Kali 76. Oh yeah, those are cool compressors. Under there, yeah, which is, I guess, people like to use that for slide and stuff, which I do a lot. Yep. Um, and then that's where it gets pretty weird, but uh, there's some weird stuff that I'll, I'll talk about later. Yeah, weird is good. 
But then I ended up just going through like a kind of a drive section. So I've got my uh, Wampler stuff, got the Tumnus and the Bell. And I use this Fuzz Lord Octave Master a lot. That gives me like my Jimi Hendrix kind of tones. Uh, and then the GT Core 1000 is really like the, the center of everything. Um, I use it to cycle through patches for different songs. And there's probably like five or six pedals on here that are MIDI controlled. Mm -hmm. So I can get my different chains going pretty easily. Um, yeah, and that's, uh, that's the gist of the actually guitar to the amp signal. Okay. But the weird stuff is, starts with this uh, Old Blood Noise Endeavors. Is that what it's called? Old Blood Noise Endeavors, yes. Signal Blender. Yep. So I've got, uh, I just use one cable and I'll plug it in and then I can just switch to either the acoustic, the banjo, or the amp. Okay. Um, the kind of interesting thing about this pedal board is I put all the instruments through the Super Ego Plus and then I have a separate chain that doesn't go through the amp it gives me like a kind of a synth pad. Mm -hmm. It gives me the kind of ethereal things that people like to do these days. Yep. And there's a secret combination of pedals underneath here that I can't talk about. <laughs> <laughs> but it gives me a very u unique textures. Um, and then I can just kind of play whatever I want and it gives it a, a you know, different, different can, sound. Can you not talk about them just because you haven't seen them for a long time? Yeah, kind of, I don't even know. I don't even want to <laughs> know like, what's what going on under <laughs> Yeah. Um, but yeah, the... Uh, the acoustic, on the acoustic side, I use the Fishman Aura. Mm -hmm. um, even though I have microphones in both of my acoustics, I feel like it just gives it a little bit more of that kind of natural microphonic space to it. And then I use it with my acoustic guitars as well. So I have a lot of different options because, uh, you know, sometimes I forget if my guitars are functioning. So I might need to like play this one acoustically or something like that. So it gives me a lot of options. Hmm. Yeah, a lot of it. Well, do you ever find yourself accidentally hitting the wrong uh, loop or pedal Yeah, in here? all the time. Every <laughs> single every single night. I wear these big boots, and I got some of these, you know, pedal cap things on that make it easier. But yeah, yeah and I keep the stage kind of dark and uh, hazy. So there's a lot of uh, happy accidents <laughs> that happen when I'm playing. Cool. Yeah, and that fits the vibe of your music, the dark, hazy stuff. Yeah. Uh -huh. yep. Now, what are you using the microcosm for here? That's kind of like a red herring, because I get a lot of guitar players trying to figure out how I get my sound, which now you know what it is. <laughs> so I just, I just put that on there so they think that it's that. Um, but every once in a while, <laughs> every once in a while, I'll turn it on. And it, um, honestly, I haven't like read the manual. So I'll just start turning it on and it always sounds cool. So Cool. Yeah, it's, I know it's a granular delay and a bunch of other stuff, too. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. A lot of filtering and other interesting things going on. Yeah. Like um, and you've got an ML9, so that's also helping you create some of those ethereal textures, I guess, right? Yeah, that's the one thing that I got to do a lot of bending over for, but to uh, put it on different settings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, listen. Why don't we Why don't we hear like the ML9 and some other things in operation? Why don't you lay a couple of your favorite sounds on us that you play and yeah. tell us how you're creating them? How's sure. That? Yeah. Let's do that. Okay. Um, the GT1000 Core has a lot of options for uh, parallel effects routing, so I can have uh, multiple delays and pitch shifting going on that are you know all separate so it gives me a cool sounds like this where i like to do a reverse delay a lot and then just a standard delay and then a pitch shift on there on top of that and then even Within this, I have the uh, the Plethora X3 in the loop of the GT1000 core, so I get a whole nother set of effects that I can use, and people don't like it, but I have fun doing it. <laughs> <laughs> When I get the uh, super ego going underneath it, it just creates big textures. And... and when you first started playing a minute ago, uh, before we got into this, what were the what were the first uh, what were the pedals that you had going during that first part of what you played? 
It sounded like a couple of delays, and I don't know what else. Yeah, was that was the same thing going on the the GT one thousand core, the reverse delay, and I just kind of. That's the cool thing about it is, once I get it set up, I can kind of just hit different combinations, and it always is something interesting, and it kind of surprises me sometimes. Okay, and uh, you know who's this little guy out here? That's the uh, SPD one kick. It's like a stomp box kind of oh, yeah. thing. Um, I actually have an 808 sample in there, mm -hmm. so it's like really powerful, more than the kind of, you know, stomping on the porch sound, so it kind of gives me a mo more modern sound. Yeah, as opposed to like an old stomp board with a, uh, a microphone on it, Yeah, which a lot of uh, guys who play solo use. Okay, so you've got a couple more devices back here, and obviously these are hand-controlled while you play, so what do you got? What are you up to? Yeah, I've got the uh, Akai MPC Live 2 that I run some kind of like uh, pre-programmed drum tracks out of there. And I'll do like live manipulation of samples and stuff. There's a lot of sampling in my set. Um, and some of it is on the album too. Uh, and I use a lot of Electron stuff too um, for like really affected samples and kind of like noisy background stuff. Keep it interesting for myself. But I do a lot of drum machine programming at home and on my record. So I've, in the last year or so, I've brought it out to the live set. Okay, so we've covered a lot of the weirdness. We've covered uh, a lot of the flexibility. What about uh, your drives? You've got drives and you've got distortions in here. What, tell us which ones you're using and uh, maybe give us a taste of dirt. Yeah, the drives have kind of just been accumulating on the pedal board um, because even though I'm quoted about um, saying blues has too much guitar soloing, I'm guilty of it myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just, yeah, I just want to have different, uh, just different ways to, to just get the, the best out of the pickups. Um, I start with the uh, TC Electronic Spark, the Mini Spark Booster. Um, that kind of stays on most of the time. Uh, uh, but the, the Tumnus is an also kind of an always on one for me, so. Okay. It's just clean. <laughs> Then the tumness helps it cut through with the amount of low end I have with the backing tracks. It really uh, helps that cut through. And then both of them together just this feels beefier. You know? Yeah, and it lets you really sustain that low end too. Yeah, but then the uh, I, I kind of switch around. I do fuzz. Sometimes uh, on this run, I've just got the overdrive that I just crank, and it, it's been serving me pretty well. Um, I get some good sustain out of it, which is mainly what I'm looking for. And then when I really need that last little push, I use the octave boost from Fuzz Lord. Yeah, there we go. We'll hear that. Which also introduces some weirdness too, which I like. So the word weirdness has come up a lot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you, you got into playing solo. What made you decide to take it weird? What was the thing that kind of made you want to step outside a little bit? Because uh, it's, you know, this is way different than just kind of hanging out and playing unamplified acoustic guitar. Yeah, a big part of it was like the, the expectation. Like a lot of blues fans have these weird expectations of what I'm supposed to be doing. And I just was annoyed that people were telling me what to do. <laughs> I hear that, yeah. <laughs> but I was also opening for a lot of like rock bands and kind of big bands and their audiences just didn't want to hear what I was doing. So I just got louder than them over time. Just kept getting louder and louder to get them to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I've always experimented with music um, and I've always done so many different genres and the Buffalo Nichols Blues thing kind of just t took off, but I didn't want to stop uh, experimenting. So I just, it's just the natural course of things for me. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. And you definitely haven't stopped experimenting, and it's great. You know, blues needs new blood all the time. It's kind of funny because it's a music that started out as a music of innovation. Yeah. Like, blues guys were the first, among the first people to use electric guitars. Yeah, that's right. They got the resonator because they needed something to cut through a really loud, you know, house party and stuff yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. and, and that sort of tradition of, uh, of innovation kind of got suppressed when it became a commercial enterprise. Yeah, that's And right. I'm really glad that you've gone back and you're taking that whole tradition into a, a modern focus. Yeah. So thank you for doing of that Of course, too. I'm doing the least commercial thing I can think of. So. <laughs> <laughs> and yet being successful at it. Oh. So there you go. <laughs> you think you know? so? Yeah, thank you. <laughs>
And thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, of course, really my pleasure. It. And thank you for being with us as well. Make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel. And always make sure to visit us at premierguitar.com. I've had, if we counted them, probably seven bad D'Addario strings in 30 years. The reason we only stock D'Addario strings is because D'Addario strings are perfect. It's nice to be able to depend on something.